This morning we're going to be looking at Peter's letter uh, to us in many ways. I said, we've said this before, haven't we? It's, it's, he's writing to sort of a general group of churches, not necessarily addressing specific issues that have arisen in a particular church. And so this is a very uh, easily applicable letter for us. And so we said a few weeks ago that this idea of, like, it's a, there's an encouragement to set your hope. To set your hope on this is what's coming. This is the, the future hope that we have. It's not just for now. It's not just for, you know, if I put my trust in Jesus, I'm going to have a great life. It's going to be great fun. Every day is going to be sunshine and rainbows and me skipping through a, you know, a wildflower meadow and, and everything's going to be brilliant. If that's your idea of brilliant, maybe it's not. But it's, that's not what, when we put our trust and our hope in Jesus, that's not what it's about. It's about setting our minds on a future hope. Something that... Oh, doesn't matter what it's like now. I can, I can face cancer diagnosis because I've got a more secure hope that is an eternal hope. And we said these are some key themes to look out for. The idea that Peter's writing to a group of non-Jews saying, you're not the people of God, historically, but you've been included in the people of God through Jesus. You've been included. And so these sort of ideas come up, and we'll, we'll see that pretty strongly this morning. These ideas that Peter calls back to Old Testament stuff, partly because when this was written, obviously this is the New Testament being written to them. So they wouldn't have had the ability to go, oh, well, let's just go and look. Let's look at all of these different books of the New Testament, these different letters, and, and see what Paul's saying. This they wouldn't have had all of those things necessarily. They would have maybe had some of it, but all of it available to them. So this inclusion in the people of God, the hope of the Christ follower to be set on eternity, not just this life. And that when we do face suffering and hardship in this life or difficulty in this life, it's to burn away the distractions and dross so that a pure faith remains. And he sort of alluded to, to, you know, we talked about being holy last week, didn't we? And he was saying about, you know, alluded to the idea of violence. When, you're, when things are burnt away, that is a, it's an intense process. So if you've got your Bible you've, uh, or you've opened your app to 1 Peter, we're starting chapter 2. And uh, I'm going to read from verse 1 through to verse, uh, all of verse 12. Uh, so put away all malice all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men. Thank you, you're doing that for me. Thank you, I forgot that. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in, in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honour is for you who believe. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offence. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners or travellers and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honourable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Let me pray. Father, I thank you that you have chosen a people for yourself. That you, Lord Jesus, through what you did on the cross, have won a people for yourself. 
a people from every nation and tribe and tongue and language. And Lord, I thank you for a foretaste of that glorious day, that glorious celebration where for eternity we get to stand amongst brothers and sisters from many different cultures, all different cultures and nations and tribes and languages. And here's celebration in, in, in all of its rich, diverse tapestry. I thank you that we have that hope because, Lord Jesus, you have won for yourself a people. You have ransomed them with your blood. Thank you that you have called us to be a royal priesthood, a holy nation for you, Lord Jesus. Help us grow into that. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I don't know if you've seen this film. Uh, I would, from best recollection, I would recommend it to you. The overall message of the film is very good. It's called Instant Family, as it says there. And it's about a, a couple who adopt three children and become an instant family. Um, I'm not quite sure where the dog fits in. I, it's been a while since I've seen it. But films like this touch a nerve, don't they? I don't know if you can... I often think, even like the Avengers, when you watch that, it's about a group of like, individuals coming together and they become a family. That, that speaks to something in human beings. Once you're in, you're in. That's the, the point of this, the idea that they, they adopt these they sort of long-term foster and then they adopt. And it's like the parents are trying to convey, you're in. You, I've chosen you. You're my child now. And obviously, you know, there's, it's, a, it's a family comedy, so there's funny moments in it. But there's some poignant moments. The first time that the, one of the children refers to the, the man as dad or the, ma, the, the woman as mother. Once you're in, the, from the parents' point of view, you're in. We're not, we're not putting you back. There was a, a film many years ago called Problem Child. I don't know if you saw that about a boy who was in uh, an orphanage who was a problem child and he'd been with, you know, dozens of families because he was so badly behaved and it was played up for laughs because he was, you know, a, a real problem child and causing chaos. But then with the family that he ended up with, the dad was like, no, I've, you're my son. Nothing you can do will change that. You are my son now. Once you're in, you're in. That's what... God is, has done with us. In verses uh, 9 and 10 of 1 Peter 2, it says this, You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. This is buzzing a little bit. I don't know if that's me or if I'm in the wrong position. Uh, a royal priest, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. It was, I can't remember if it was last week in the sermon or in the, the sort of time of praying before the meeting, which everyone is invited to that. At 10 o'clock we pray for the upcoming meeting, that we would meet with God, that God would change lives as we're together. Anyone is, a, is, is welcome to come and be part of that. It's not exclusive in any way other than you have to be here at 10, um, which maybe that is quite exclusive. But it was mentioned anyway last week that this is, this is an unusual group of people. Not by makeup of the individuals that are in it, in terms of you're not an unusual person, although some of us are. But this is an unusual mix of people. I look around the room and I think, you know, would I be friends with you if it was not for Jesus Christ? Would I even know you? Would we have even crossed paths? I mean, maybe we'd be friends if we had crossed paths. But would we know each other even? Because this is, this is an unusual mix of people. It's a wide variety of ages. It's a wide variety of cultural backgrounds. <coughs> Peter is saying the same thing to these churches. Once you were not a people, you were individual families or individuals or perhaps you know a little village somewhere. And you weren't a people, you were just your own little groups. But now, 
Now you are God's people. You've been brought in. You've been joined. You've been grafted on to the people of God. And he uses these different phrases. He says that they're chosen. That they're a royal priesthood. A holy nation. A people for his own possession. And as we said, these are, these are callbacks to the Old Testament. How God spoke to the prophets about his people. In Deuteronomy 10, verse 15, it says this, Yet the Lord set his heart on love on your fathers and chose their offspring after them. You above all peoples, as you are to this day. God speaking to the people of God said, I've chosen you. I chose your fathers and their offspring and I've chosen you. When we're in God's people, he's chosen us. We're a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Exodus 19, 6 says, you shall, God speaking to the Israelites says, you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. A people for his own possession. Deuteronomy 7, for you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession and out of all the peoples who are on the earth. God chose that nation. God chose that family. Isaiah 43 says, The people whom I, is God speaking, formed for myself that they might declare my praise. We are chosen. We are a royal priesthood. We are a holy nation. A people for his own possession. Even that call from last week that Andy sort of honed in on, be holy because I am holy, that's, you know, that's a call back to the Old Testament, isn't it? That's not like Peter's come up with something new. He's saying the, the call that was on the people of God of old, the Israelite nation, is now on the church. Because we've been joined in. All of the stuff that Peter is saying to them, he's saying to us, he's saying to, to you. You are chosen by God. You are a royal priest. You are part of his holy nation. You are a people of his own possession. That can, I think possession maybe seems a little bit old-fashioned, that idea. Oh, I don't want to be possessed by someone. But actually, I think... If we understand what it means, I'm with them. They're mine. You know, I don't know if you've ever had a moment like that where one of your group is being picked on or sort of there's a little bit of thing and you sort of stand alongside them. And you think, oh, I might get a good hide in here, but I'm with them. They're my, that's my person. That's, my, that's part of my tribe. We've not just been included. It's not just like, yeah, okay, you can, you know, you can be the sort of second cousin group, maybe, twice removed. No, we've been included in the royal line, the royal priesthood. We've been adopted into the royal family. We're not an outsider sort of living alongside, like me when I was living with those families. It was interesting. Some of the families really embraced me, and I was like, okay, I'm, I'm part of the family here. I've been... Given a chore list, great. You know, others it was like, there's your room. You know, if you want to eat with us, let us know. Otherwise, just sort yourself out. <laughs> One of the, the families um, on my first night there locked the door while I was out, like dead bolted it. They forgot I was living with them, I suppose. And uh, so I had to go and sleep on someone's sofa because uh, they'd just completely forgotten about me. It's not like that. We're not, God doesn't lock the door on us. He remembers us. He knows that we're part of the family. He's included us. I mean, this is out. We need to get how outrageous this is. This is like at the coronation, which is coming up. This guy, Charles, going, Hey, everyone. I know I've just been crowned king. It's all about me, but I want to just introduce you to someone. This is Gavin. Gavin's now a prince. He's not, you know, he's not above William. But he's, I've made him a prince. He's in the royal family. Everyone, this is Prince Gavin. Okay, welcome in. Let's give it up for Prince Gavin. Come on. That would be mad, wouldn't it? That would be like completely wild if that happened. 
If Charles just picked some rando out of the crowd and said, this guy, this girl, that's it, they're in now, they've got the status, I'm, I'm putting the cloak around them, I'm putting a ring on their finger, I'm crowning, I'm giving them status and authority and you know, all that goes along with the, this position as part of the royal line. Wouldn't that be wild? No? Yeah. That's what's happened to you and me. That's what's happened to us. This guy is not called Gavin. I searched for just like, I searched for like average British man. <laughs> and this is what came up. He actually involved, was involved in like 2018 with some sort of thing with the French police where he stood up for some, like filmed them as they were attacking some protesters or something, I don't know. But anyway. <laughs> and and he did, he's, you know, he got one article in the Independent, that was it. Um, but this is the glory of the gospel. We've been, we've been brought into the royal household. Let's get off of Gavin. <laughs> we've been brought into the royal household. Romans 8 says, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. We are co-heirs with Christ. Jesus is the big brother. I know it's not kind of like this anymore. We have to, when we read things like this, we have adopted as sons. We have to understand in, in the time that it was written, the, the status of like the firstborn son. They inherited, if not everything, the majority. Adam's, you know, nodding in approval over there, my big brother. <laughs> we've been included in the inheritance we're co-heirs in a kingdom it's the glory of the gospel we've been ushered into the royal household but it's not just you it's us God has chosen a people not a person Peter says this you are a chosen race a royal priesthood a holy nation, a people for his own possession. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. You could read it like this. We are a chosen race. We are a royal priesthood. We are a holy nation. We are a people for his own possession that we may proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his marvellous night. Once we weren't a people, now we are God's people. Once we'd not received mercy, now we have received mercy. A Christian striking out on their own is a sheep by itself. God used the... Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. You are my sheep. Sheep are not like solo animals. You know, it's not like they go out and they're like, oh, that's the adventurous sheep. You know, they go away for a while and they come back and they've got some good stories. It's a herd. It's a group. And when a sheep is on its own... There's something not quite right. Now, maybe one of them sort of wandered off for a little bit to chew some grass over there, but they're still within sight of the herd. They're still linked in. I saw this uh, quote this morning. Uh, it's from Terry Virgo, uh, who's the founder of New Frontiers. It says, when doing reconstruction... Make sure to not remove a load-bearing wall. So in your Christian life, when making adjustments, make sure the fundamental things are in place. Some things are essential. Foundational truths mustn't be adjusted. If you lose them, chaos will follow. I know I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here because you are here, but you can pass this message along 
You cannot do this on your own. You cannot do the Christian life on your own. If you try, you are just a lone sheep. It's a reason that's not a phrase. You know, you have a lone wolf because they can look after themselves. A lone sheep is in danger. Even when, Christ, even when God makes promises to individuals, it's for the benefit of the people of God. He speaks to Abraham, he says, I'm going to bless you and make you a multitude, make your family huge, so that you will be a blessing to the nations. He says to Moses, You're, I'm calling you to lead my people out of captivity. Joshua, I'm going to bring you into the promised land as you lead the people of God. We could go on. Let's not allow each other to get suckered into this mindset. I can work it out on my own. I can do it on my own. We live in a moment in time that is craving authentic community. Part of being authentic with people is having a difficult conversation and going, I don't think you should be doing that. If you are never challenged by anyone, are you really in authentic community? So what are we a people for? We're a people for God's glory. A people with purpose. You're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from the passion of the flesh which wage war against your soul keep your conduct among the gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers they may see your good deeds and glorify god on the day of visitation the point of being the people of god is to glorify god to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable through jesus christ We've been called that we may proclaim the, the glorious excellencies of him who called us. He called us out of darkness into his marvellous light. Again, a couple of weeks ago, I said, you know, rejoice in salvation. I was in darkness. I didn't know what I was doing. Now I'm in the light. I'm getting it wrong, but at least I know what I'm doing now. I'm trying the right things. We display the glory of God. We proclaim it. We tell people of his glory, of his excellencies. This is what he's done for me. Are you proclaiming the goodness of God in your life? Are you displaying the glory of God? When people speak against you as an evildoer, they'll see, they see your good deeds, and, but they will glorify God on the day of visitation. I think it's important, that last bit, it's on the day of visitation. You might not get your justice, your moment of justice now. You might be spoken against, you might be discouraged, people might say all sorts of horrible things about you that aren't true. But in the day of visitation, the day of judgment, the day when God lays forth, okay, this is, this is the reality of the situation. People go, yeah, no, actually, I said these things about that person but it was for your glory. They, were, they lived to honour you. Verses 4 and 5 in the verses that we read earlier talk about Jesus being the, the cornerstone, the stone that was rejected but actually became the most important. It was chosen by God. If Jesus was rejected, we will be rejected too. We might find difficulties, but we've been chosen by God to bring glory to him through our lives, through what we say and through what we do, because we are the people of God, a royal priesthood. Let me pray and then we're going to move on.
Father God, I thank you that you have chosen us, you have called us, you have brought us out of darkness into your marvellous light. I pray that we would enjoy that, we would celebrate it, we would delight in it, we would delight in the fact that we've been ushered in like Gavins into the, the royal priesthood, the royal family, we've been brought in, that we are an instant family, we are brothers and sisters, we're not out there on our own as sheep lost in the wilderness, we are together being watched over by the good shepherd keep us together lord keep us in genuine community help us to build those bonds perhaps today even as we eat together help us to have genuine conversations or at least open the door to those genuine conversations that we might be authentic brothers and sisters in your household in jesus name